the uh, uh, she's monitoring the chat room. We'll be providing answers to questions as we're moving forward. Teresa is our administrative assistant and just turned on the recording so that we can post this later on and as a resource for those who couldn't make it. And um, so a little bit about me that I work for the Chancellor's Office and uh, I'm filling in pinch hitting for Kathy Harris who is not uh, doesn't have a voice today, um, quite literally because of a cold, bad cold. So um, my background is that I've been the co-PI on this project for the last two years and uh, have worked closely with the California OER Council and helped develop the cool for adorg website and also now the RFP process for the AB 798 project. So in this webinar today, we're going to talk a little bit about the implementation of AB 798, some of the resources available, the plan that's a part of the AB 798 RFP process, um, the timeline for that, several recommended steps, brainstorm a few examples based on some of the questions we've received so far about uh, uh, filling out and pre in preparation for the filling out of the RFP document or the response and the submission by each California Community College and CSU and answer any questions that you might have as well. And feel free to jump in the chat room area which is in the bottom, bottom left hand corner of the screen if you have any questions. Um, there's also a little hand underneath your name under the, where your participant list is and you can click on that to raise your hand that gets the attention of the presenter and then I can always stop and answer questions as well. So um, last week we had a big conference about kicking off the AB 798 uh, funding RFP process and Sarah Brady who is a legislative analyst or assistant for um, uh, Mrs. Benia who was the one that um, wrote and uh, passed the uh, Textbook Affordability Act, AB 798, presented, and this is one of her shot, screenshots that she provided to, in kind of a way to explain how AB 798 works. So um, the aspect of this is that it's meant to be a collaborative process and to include as many faculty as possible. Um, and as a result, it also wants to include the leadership of a campus so, so that they're aware of um, the funding that's available and also to possibly make them aware of the options of providing low or no cost materials to students. We find that that still is a challenge for some of our, our colleagues as instructors and or administrators throughout um, higher ed. And so that's uh, another aspect of what AB 798 is, is to provide an, an awareness and discovery for um, our teaching uh, colleagues. And, and by the way, I still teach for Long Beach State, right, even though I work in the Chancellor's Office. So um, part of this uh, RFP requires the Academic Senate to be involved because of resolution requirement. And then uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how the California OER Council is going to be involved in this process. And then how um, this uh, RFP requires and requests a plan and a grant uh, to, in order to receive the grant. Uh, so the grant is meant to be, uh, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a little bit, but um, funding for each campus between $10,000 and $50,000. Okay, so let me see, i got to hit the next button correctly. So from the OER Adoption Incentive Program, the focus is really going to be on professional development for faculty and staff. And um, so it's not meant to be stipends. Uh, that's handed to a faculty member if they adopt a an, an low or no cost textbook. It's really meant to help them with that transition process from their current resource or textbook and uh, into looking into possibilities of other resources, such as possibly a single textbook or multiple resources coming either from the library or from uh, places such as the Khan Academy or YouTube or where there are plenty of other resources that could be high quality and address uh, specific content in the course. Um, we also, uh, the OER, this incentive program will adopt or support curation activities. It won't support the development of new OER, open educational resources, but the curation of current resources and because most OER is has a Creative Commons license on it, allowing for reusing or revising the materials because they're very openly um, 
uh, available uh, through Creative Commons licensing. So um, the ability to curate the materials to select certain chapters from one book or one resource and, or some journals and compile them with other activities as long as they're all open is very much supported in this um, uh, RFP process as well. And um, the um, instructors, because they are poss possibly going to be curating the materials or researching and understanding the adoption of a new, uh, a new set of materials will um, be permitted to per, uh, some release time through this um, grant. So it's not necessarily just handing them funds because they adopted a textbook, but there has to be some activity, whether it's professional development or some sort of activity around curation that will um, justify the funding for an instructor. And then there's other ways to uh, provide funding within a campus, and, to, and that is to provide technology support for the students staff or faculty, so from the perspective of information literacy, so some students have never used a digital resource before, so possibly providing some digital literacy uh, orientation or training for the students, whether that's by a webcast or a video or um, just a little bit of a short introduction at the beginning of the term, same for the staff and the faculty, providing them technical support through this transition process. So that's um, what this adoption process supports in its funding. Another requirement in this funding is to uh, work with the Academic Senate on your campus to adopt a resolution that will focus on um, increasing student access to high quality open educational resources and reduce the cost of textbooks and supplies. And, um, we have verbiage um, directly on the RFP site, which is located at coolfored.org. And I'm going to type that, or maybe Kathy, you could type that in the window. Coolfored.org is where the RFP resides currently. And there is example um, terminology there for a campus resolution. It doesn't need to be uh, very um, complex. It actually only needs to be one line that's been uh, uh, accepted by the Academic Senate in one way or the, or the other, and that information is explained on the RFP page. The idea here is that um, the institution becomes aware of this grant process, becomes aware of the state's interest in funding lower or no-cost materials, and so elevating the, um, the knowledge of um, um, these resources to pe folks who might not be aware of them at all and also to make sure that the uh, campus is uh, uh, invested in the funds that they will receive from the states through this RFP process and, and, be, and support their plan um, and, uh, and as to how they're going to implement them. So that's what the second bullet here points to is the, um, let's get my little pointer finger if I can find it, um, is to approve a plan so the campus also needs to create a plan on how they're going to, um, uh, well, how much funding they're going to request, and then also how they're going to implement it on the campus. And again, that shows the faculty commitment and readiness to use OER. And that's the intention of including the academic senate's decisions uh, in this process. So some details or some information um, just kind of bulletized here, but also uh, very carefully laid out on the um, the RFP site at coolfored.org um, is to uh, compose a plan. And the details include various aspects that are outlined here, whether you're detailing how much ta staff or technology support you're going, to you're going to need to provide, how the faculty will learn about coolfored.org on, on the campus so that they find resources that could be very helpful for them that are, are, have already been curated and peer reviewed. Um, it must include the number of academic departments and course sections, which will be selected to be focused on for this, this project. And um, uh, it could be range from 10 courses to 50 courses, um, depending on um, what the campus feels comfortable doing and um, what departments are going to be interested in participating. And the state wants to be able to make sure that those are identified and um, uh, uh, available in the plan. 
Um, the, the anticipated percentage of cost savings, which I'll cover in just a minute, needs to be in this plan. Um, ways that the existing faculty development programs are being used or will be enhanced as a result of this plan. So that might mean uh, bringing in some outside trainers or workshop development folks from other campuses or from the California OER Council or using existing folks who are familiar with OER resources and um, the cool4ed.org site. Um, how to access um, how access to OER will be provided to the students. That will be really important as aspect as well, meaning um, students will most likely get access via electronic versions or links, but per, um, we still find that many students are interested in print versions, so how will that be provided um, or how is that thought through and perhaps a, some sort of a, um, a partnership with a bookstore or talking to a bookstore on your campus might serve that. Um, opportunity as well. And then of course you'll want to include the grant amount that you request and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So that's a quick overview of the plan that's a requirement uh, for submitting for the RFP. So right now I've talked about two things, the Academic Senate resolution and then the plan um, that needs to be, both of these need to be submitted as a part of the RFP to request funding. Um, more information is that uh, um, each course would be about, if you're selecting 10 courses or 50 courses, uh, whatever they are, cannot receive more than $1,000 per course, and that's, uh, um, that's per the um, Senate bill, uh, Assembly bill, sorry, and, um, and that the student savings would be gre uh, greater than 30%. So what we have here is that the decrease in the cost of materials over uh, divided by the cost from the previous academic term should provide you the 30% savings. So if you're, for example, going with a book that is 150, that course that uses a book currently for $150, and then they select a completely open educational resource, the savings will be zero. I mean, it will be 100% and um, that um, there will be no cost for the students. But we understand that um, there are still some resources that are, could be low cost as, um, and, and supportive of student learning and success and still be reduced and not be full price. So that's why we're saying that we're still looking for uh, a 30% savings, not 100%. And so the grants, as I mentioned earlier, can range from your, each campus requesting the minimum of 10,000 and the maximum of 50,000. So that could be 10 to 50 classes or course sections, either way. And then, of course, um, you're probably aware of, maybe not, but there is about $3 million state money available for this entire project. And we're hoping to spend all of that out the first year. So, so far I've talked about um, the um, resolution, um, the academic senate resolutions, the um, the plan that is required for submission, and then also um, some of the funding that's the details in the funding. Um, so one of the resources that will be key, play a key role here will be the California OER Council, which is a group of faculty um, from each segment of higher ed in California, um, three faculty from each group that have been funded through previous Senate bills to establish um, the California open online library, which is cool for ed.org, and the 50 courses that were selected for that library and um, to select the open textbooks or, or open their free and open textbooks that are um, on that site. And then they also managed and coordinated the evaluation instruments and the, um, the uh, evaluations or peer reviews that took, have taken place so far. Um, so, the California OER Council um, will provide uh, their um, expertise and, and on existing OER and best practice for adoption um, based on whether or not to reach out to them and for support through this grant writing proposal or the RFP submission process. They will then, once the RFPs have been submitted, um, they will then review the campus plans um, they will be the, uh, uh, they, they will use the rubric that's also listed on the um, RFP, which is, can be found at coolfored.org, 
and um, so they will provide their recommendations for campuses as to uh, how much funding they receive, et cetera. Um, they could select up to 100 plans, depending on how many are received and or um, are written in the way that meets all the criteria of the RFQ. And um, that will all take place and be submitted to the chancellor of the CSU within um, the summer time frame, the late summer time frame. And, um, and if you're wondering why the CSU chancellor is involved, it's because that was written into the assembly bill as well, that the uh, CSU is to coordinate in the funds through this, for this project and to also coordinate the uh, selection and distribution of the grants. So hopefully you're asking questions in the bottom left corner of the chat room and uh, um, and as Kathy is taking for following those pretty closely. So we thought we'd talk to you a little bit about the California Open Online Library for Education. And if you type this into your computer right now, you'll come up with a site that has a black bar directly under the image that is up on the screen. And you'll see that you have several areas um, of resources there. There's the fact there's a find option. There's a faculty showcase option, the list of 50 courses that the um, group selected, the California OER Council selected, and then a um, link to all the e-textbook reviews. Um, so that's kind of the gold mine for all of the um, items that were really collected into the coolfored.org library. And as you can see here, it leverages um, lots of resources that are in the merlot.org website. And um, if you're not familiar with merlot.org, it's a uh, a catalog of open re educational resources beyond open textbooks as well. Um, in as much as the textbooks are all cataloged there, so that's about 3,600. Merlot.org has about 66,000 resources from links to simulations and quiz and test banks and uh, um, all kinds of other journal articles, all kinds of open resources uh, to be used in education and or workforce skills study areas. And then, of course, Cool Fred, as I mentioned earlier, is a collaboration between the three higher ed systems in California. And it's been funded by the state legislature and matching funds, uh, being from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the um, William and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Sorry. I get all those Williams and Bills mixed up sometimes. So that's cool for ed.org. If you haven't already been there, I encourage you to take a look. It's a wealth uh, of knowledge and resource um, and has been uh, set up for that purpose for the, for the higher ed systems of California. As I mentioned earlier, there's the course showcase where 50 um, courses that are uh, identified by a common identity system, the common ID, which is the CID, um, which means that these courses should be articulated across the three higher ed systems in California. And um, so that was the main focus of the cool California Open Online Library is to find those courses that are general, usually general ed or GE courses and um, that are available to transfer between the three systems um, from one system to the next. The e-textbooks um, have been reviewed by faculty from the three systems and uh, are quite robust, sometimes three to four pages long. And um, uh, the California OER Council um, were very careful to include this four major aspects in, the, um, in their uh, reviews. Um, they had a template around uh, universal design and, and editorial aspects and um, technical aspects and one other one I can't remember off the top of my head of each of these books and um, and the, the reviews were created to be as usable and readable as possible for faculty who are considering uh, textbooks such as Carrie who came on earlier and mentioned that she teaches physics and is very interested in finding low and low cost materials so you would go, Carrie would go to that area of the e textbook reviews and locate the physics reviews and would have um, some input from fellow peers on those textbooks that are selected and highlighted in cool4ed.org. Another unique uh, aspect of cool4ed.org was to add faculty showcases. And what we've been trying to do here is to capture faculty stories of their adoption of these open resources and um, 
So we have a myriad of faculty from the three systems and, and a few from outside the state just because that's how we started developing it two years ago. But for the most part, it's faculty within the state who have adopted these textbooks and we wanted to get the story about what course, what textbook they used and what or resources, not just one single textbook. Some of them you'll see they'll have multiple resources. Um, what course they used it for, talk a little bit about that course, share their syllabus, maybe even a sample assignment. And then on the um, last feature in the faculty showcase to talk about their adoption process, why they felt compelled to find a low or no cost material for their course, what they felt, how they felt about the quality of the resources, and then to share the students' experience. Uh, many of them have done, uh, created and um, uh, surveys for their students and they share their feedback or they just provide qualitative um, comments that students have provided as well. So that's also meant to help an instructor who's just learning about these resources to get a sense that, oh wow, other people have used these and, and now we see what their perspective is and this is a course just like mine and I can maybe look at the syllabus and see what they did, et cetera, et cetera. So that um, continues to grow. Um, we are in the process of adding quite a few more re uh, reviews that we've been able to gather over the last few months. And it's uh, constantly being updated and uh, refreshed with additional reviews. And then um, uh, another resource that you can find in the Cool for Ed dot org site on the black bar that is across that menu bar is a find feature and if you click on the find feature and the first option is to find open and free and open textbooks. If you click on that then you'll see a category of disciplines. And so if I was teaching for example or I do teach in in education, I could click on a link that's associated with my discipline and then all the textbooks in Merlot.org will pop up um, and it with a subcategory listing on the left side so that I can drill down to possible textbooks and or resources within Merlot.org. They also have a federated search in Merlot.org under the advanced search feature which, which links to other um, databases and uh, free and open databases. So that includes the MIT database and the Open Textbook Network and I can't remember what the other ones are. There's a whole list of them. And that can also be a resource for someone who's looking for um, materials for their course. So that's a little bit about the cool for edorg site. So um, back to uh, the RFP planning process. Um, these are uh, areas that you could include in your plan. Um, and so we provided types of services and then we've also provided strategies for those services. So for example, in your plan you might include a communication and outreach element as to how you're going to address these issues. Um, that could be um, what we will be providing are sample memos about AB 798 email flyers and webinars, but you should provide how you're going to implement these resources on your campus in, from the communication and outreach perspective. Um, and from the training and professional development area, the California Council will provide services if needed during the this rest of this year, um, since they're continued to be funded through the rest of this year, and or um, they can also provide webinars, how-to videos, and regional workshops, et cetera, which you are participating in today. One of the regional workshops or webinars, but also in your plan, we'd like you to consider how you're going to address these issues on your campus, the training and professional development, and to provide some strategies around that. So other services around help and support, um, we highly recommend you enlist your reference librarians and campus technology support. In other words, your reference librarians know where your resources are, within, are, are located within their library databases, and those can be um, available for the students on your campus since they usually can um, have a password to get into them. So that's something that we leverage in the CSU quite heavily, um, our resources that are available in the library databases. And then also what we mean by campus technology support is if you have an instructional technology person or people, um, they can help with um, a faculty member who's trying to uh, find resources 
uh, for their courses, or they can also help with uh, um, with the electronic or digital aspect of it, whether it's linking it into your learning management system or or onto a certain web pages that you're using for your courses that your instructors are using for their courses. So um, those are some areas that you want to address in your plan as well. From the perspective of print copies, as I mentioned earlier, we highly recommend working with your bookstore. Most bookstores have some sort of a print option at their location. And um, in the CSU, we've worked on prepping them. And in the CSU, we have several different bookstore models. We have a Barnes & Noble set of bookstores. We have Follett bookstores. And then we also have independent bookstores. So we meet with all of them. And we've let them know about this initiative. and. Um, ask them to consider providing those kinds of resources. Whether the students can find the printed version online, whether it's through the website where the um, OER um, uh, resource is available, whether it's at openstax.org or um, um, sailor.org or some of the other ones that are available. They, they sometimes have PDF versions or print versions available. Um, but sometimes the students need to have a place where they can print the entire resource. And OpenStax, you can purchase the resources already available, hard copy, but there are other ways that students can also get a hold of a print uh, printed version of their digital copy. And, and just as a back a little aside on that, in the CSU a few years ago, we did a quick survey about our with our students to see where they were with digital readiness. And a third of them were very um, comfortable with using digital copies or materials. And a third of them were, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, not sure about it, but if it meant that they could have a free uh, resource, a textbook or whatever, they were really um, uh, happy to try a digital resource. And then the other third were still very um, interested in a print version of their textbook. So. Um, we don't want to discount the fact that um, our students are still, um, several stu of our students are still very um, comfortable in the print environment um, until they become a little bit more comfortable in the um, uh, digital environment. So from the concept of curation and discovery, coolfored.org um, has quite a bit of resources and so does the merlot.org um, site. And um, we have a, a coursey portfolio tool in Merlot, which one can um, uh, select and or add reviews or information on the various three titles that are there and create kind of one's own curated version of a book and then link to that into one's LMS. So there are lots of ways of curating and, and, and cataloging and, and um, Find and selecting the resources that are available, the myriad of resources that are available, the open ed resources that are available. Um, so from the perspective of technology services, um, we can we recommend you put a link in, uh, from Cool for Ed into your LMS um, if you can, so that the faculty can find it more easily. Um, you know, we're talking about some of your campuses are huge and you have lots of faculty and you can't reach all of them all the time. Um, um, so having a link in your LMS where they might learn to click on it and say, wow, what is this? Maybe I can find something that might help them begin that search for resources um, on, uh, within the OER environment. And, it, and if you're very interested in that, Merlot also has LMS integration. So you can get an integration into Blackboard or um, all the major LMSs that kind of what they call a, a building block and um, is also uh, allows for the instructor to easily find, um, you know, based on keywords or whatever, um, open resources there as well. And then um, services, uh, additional services are making sure that your campus leadership are aware of, of this initiative and that there is a growing interest and, and highly um, or a list of catalog of resources of highly high quality um, materials that are growing and um, curated and peer reviewed as well so that they can um, become familiar with that as they speak uh, with their peers and or with the departments that they manage um, or the colleges that they manage on their campuses. We also have a, a Voices online community. Um, which uh, we'll maybe um, Kathy and or 
Teresa can put a link into the um, text box um, for those who might be interested in joining that. And we'll be, um, it's kind of a place where we'll be posting announcements and allow people to ask questions as well. So from a timeline perspective, um, all proposals for the first round of the RFP um, should be submitted by June 30th to each campus. One, there will be one proposal per campus. And um, usually there will be someone on the campus that's been selected to be the coordinator of that proposal. There can be a, a, can be a group of people working together on it, but there will be an individual that's selected and identified as the coordinator and all of that which includes the Academic Senate Resolution, the Campus Plan, and there's also a spreadsheet that's on the website that um, allows for each course to be listed and uh, what the current costs are. Um, so in order to set up that um, process of identifying the specific sections or courses, those are all on the coolfored.org site. Those all need to be submitted by June 30th, and we'll have a link up on the course redesign site, which will be where one submits these proposals. And then um, the funding should be distributed by September 30th. It will be distributed from the CSU to your campuses or to your, um, so within the CSU we'll distribute to the campuses because we already have that process set up. And with the community colleges, we'll probably distribute through the main office, the chancellor's office, and then they will um, transfer those funds to the individual campuses. And then the uh, initiative has a single year October 16th, 7th, June 2017, to implement um, the first round of, of um, your project, your initiative, and then um, we will expect a progress report by June 30th of, of uh, 2017. So this, this um, date, this October 16th through June 17th, is, is kind of important because it gives you a sense of when these courses will actually have to be taught with these open material these open materials. So if you're getting the funding in the fall, then they can't be taught in the fall necessarily. They could be taught in the summer of 17. Uh, let's see, no, wait, so we'll back it up here. They can be taught in the spring of 17, the um, winter, if you have a winter quarter or session, spring, and even the, um, but since the reports are due in June of 17, it really just kind of constricts it to those two terms um, for the most part. And um, I don't think we'll spend much time on this, but um, there, if there is residual funding left over, that in, in other words, not all of it is distributed, but in the first round, then there will be an opportunity for campuses who submit their progress reports on time and have, have actually shown the 30% savings um, and who are interested to um, apply for additional funding. But we're not sure if that will happen based on the types of uh, um, proposal and we get the first round. So that's something we will update the website and folks on in the future. So we thought we'd just run through some steps for you. Um, uh, we've, um, we recommend that you go to the coolfored.org site and uh, scroll down a little bit and you'll see the uh, link to review the RFP and you'll see a link to the evaluation rubric that's been developed by the California OER Council. and um, we also have a few background resources there if you're interested in that. We have a more, a little bit more defined timeline there, similar to what I just showed you, but a little bit more defined. And then um, we will, uh, uh, we also have additional information there about um, brainstorming your drafts and goals, and that's what we're going to do next, actually, in the next few slides. But you might want to check out the toolkit, number one, which is linked there as well. And these toolkits, the one or two more, um, are, are being created by the California OER Council to help you all in this process, um, provide more resources for you as you move through the RFP planning and um, process. So one of the questions might be how you find stakeholders on your campuses. And this is something that has been extracted from the toolkit. And so we've got a full, four bullets here. Um, first of all, um, uh, uh, there is a link on in the toolkit about a, guide, a sample guide on how to involve faculty in the affordable learning solutions programs um, in order to make them aware and discover um, there are uh, there are possibly alternative resources to the, the materials that they're currently teaching in their courses. 
there's a value proposition framework available as a link off this toolkit as well. And there are case studies and published research in the toolkit as well. So um, if folks are looking for more research and uh, are more data driven and really want to see what others throughout the nation are doing in regards to um, uh, the efficacy and um, uh, student success actions around faculty who are adopting open educational resources. We've got some case studies and published research in the toolkit as well. And then um, we have uh, teaching portfolios um, that are linked into the faculty showcases as well. That they're, These are the faculty showcases that are on the coolfred.org site. And this is a link to those as well. So that's where you could find your stakeholders for this project. People that are already doing it, people who are very interested in doing it, like Carrie, sorry Carrie to keep pointing you out, who's on this uh, webinar right now, is very interested in adopting low or no cost materials for her physics courses. And before I forget, Carrie, you might want to check out PHET, P-H-E-T. Um, that's a really cool open resource site for STEM folks. STEM is, um, that's developed at the University of Colorado Boulder that has lots of cool simulations for physics and math courses, and they're all free, and uh, also supported by the Hewlett Foundation. So who else should you include in your initiative and consider, as we mentioned earlier, your bookstores and your libraries and your in educational technology group? Um, that would be anybody that you might have that's helping your faculty with developing online courses uh, or instructional designers, as we also call them sometimes. And then also including your student associations, um, because they uh, played a huge role in passing this um, bill, the Benia bill, or the AB 798 at the state level, because they really pushed hard for the fact that they um, are very interested in having low and no-cost resources. And the more the students understand what's available to them and that they could be advocating for that um, on their campuses through their academic senates. We see academic student academic senates passing resolutions to encourage faculty to select low or no-cost materials, to look at coolside.org. All these activities help with the um, uh, um, process of help, um, helping faculty become aware of, of alternative options. Um, so uh, what we're providing for this process is um, these informational webinars, which you're on right now. We have, we're in the process of building um, FAQs, and uh, we, built, we uh, posted one last week. It's up on the RSP site, which is at coolfored.org. And um, but we just received a bunch of new questions, so we'll be updating that by the end of this week. So the FAQs will be updated regularly. So these are questions that are coming in from uh, folks like you about the RFP and how to fill it out and what what counts and what doesn't count, et cetera, et cetera. So consult the FAQ as much as possible. Register for the updates um, on the Cool for Ed site. You can click a link and type in your um, contact info. And if there are any updates, like the FAQ being updated, then we'll just blank email you with that information so you won't have to go checking all the time. Um, you can also submit a draft of your proposal at any time um, to um, call this email, uh, the last bullet here, um, and we will um, take a look at your proposal and, um, and you know, point out if, if aspects of it are missing or um, you know, what you're doing really well and, and uh, make sure that we help you um, curate your own proposal, per se, to uh, uh, be successful in the grant um, uh, process. Okay. And then um, in the Academic Senate proposal, we're getting lots of questions around that. Um, the required language based on what's in the bill um, is that one needs to increase student access to high quality open educational resources and reduce the cost of textbooks and supplies for students in course sections for which open educational resources are to be adopted to accomplish cost savings for students. That's quite a mouthful. And really, if that's what you have in your Senate um, resolution, that's fine. Um, we do have some advice here on this page in that you could include it in your whereas section. For those of you who are community college folks, if you go look at the RFP, there is a link there that was developed by the California OER Council members who are community college members, our faculty, and um, you could 
just copy and paste what they did, uh, have there into your resolution. Um, and then we also have a sample resolution up there for um, the CSUs as well. Um, we, uh, yeah, to avoid changing the acquired language because we do need to see that in the proposal. It can't be we might do it. We we think we'll do it. Um, the state is saying that you are going to um, focus on this. It's not saying who's going to do it or how it's going to be done necessarily, but that there is a commitment to lowering the cost of um, textbooks and, and through this process. It doesn't have to have as many more details than that as you can see in the required language here. And then if you need any assistance with um, your your draft resolution, feel free to email this, this um, link as well and we'll get back to you right away as to um, if there's anything that we could recommend around that and uh, help, hopefully help you with that process too. All right, so we have some more examples here. Um, where do we begin? Well, if you're looking for what courses you could concentrate on, you might look at the list of disciplines, the 50 courses that are highlighted in the Cool for Ed reviews, um, because there are already textbooks available for those courses that have been peer reviewed by the higher ed, ed segments in California. And those are considered GE courses. They're also articulated between the systems. So those could be disciplines where you start. So you might say, oh, okay, we have physics and biology and maybe uh, history. And um, so maybe I could go talk to those departments to see are you interested in any faculty interested. You might put a call out for that on your campus to see um, where there might be some take, uh, uptake there. And um, so that could be a place for you to start for your campus partners. Another um, brainstorming example question we received is, can we include those courses or sections that have already used OER textbooks? Well, that is um, based on the, the bill. We don't want to see the same courses, usually if they've um, selected OER through our other programs, have been funded in some way. So we don't want to, they've already demonstrated cost savings, so we don't really want to see courses that have already used OER. But if those instructors want to um, participate, uh, um, by using a lower cost homework platform or another textbook or some other resource that they haven't used previously um, or even use works from the library to find materials um, that will for their courses, then that would be considered okay. So not using a, a textbook they've already been using, but to actually branch out and find other resources that are either low cost, because that's why we have the 30%. We don't have 100%. It's 30% to allow for some low-cost ancillary resources if that's helpful for the course. So another question is, how do we engage faculty who are already using tech OER but can't be included in these courses? Well, um, there is a way for asking them to become a workshop leader um, and talk about or share their story um, as to what drove them, motivated them to find um, quality OER resources for their courses, uh, low or no cost resources, and then um, tell us about how that adoption process worked and what their students' reaction is to that and what, you know, their tips and tricks around that has been as well. Uh, for example, last week I was at Cal State San Marcos on Friday and they put together a faculty panel and they did a workshop. So, um, you know, part of this AB 798 is to provide professional development for your faculty on your campus and how to do all this, how to select an open textbook or how to convert your course using a digital resource which is an open textbook and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Part of that uh, professional development could be asking a panel of two or three, four faculty on your campus who might have already done that to participate and share their stories. Um, and it's very motivating and inspiring for others. Um, having sat through several of them in the past, in the recent past. Another question we receive is how do we ensure sustainability of the uh, textbook affordability act the funds have been exhausted? Well, we heard one group last week at our big conference say um, that there could be uh, exploration of applying for student equity funding at avenues as well. Um, they could set up a study of their sections to see if one of the equity issues is addressed by a free textbook. Um, and we will offer to share our student and faculty surveys from our pilot project for that process if you're interested, and those will be included in toolkit too. And if you sign up for 
um, to get updates uh, from the cool, on the coolfred.org site under the RFP section, you will know when that toolkit number two is posted. But um, uh, another feature that I've, I heard about last Friday at San Marcos is with the student equity funding, you could possibly partner with other campuses in your district um, and or with a CSU that's nearby because uh, most of the CSUs are going to be involved because we know we've got a pretty strong affordable uh, um, program, affordable learning solutions program within the CSU. So there could be some student equity or uh, studies partnership and funding um, uh, options there as well. All right, so I've kind of gone through the slides pretty quickly and um, wanted to be, uh, let you have some time to ask about, you ask your questions to share your uh, comments and or concerns about this initiative and the upcoming uh, opportunity to apply for funding for your campus. Um, you can click the microphone button on your computer if you want to ask the question via the microphone on your computer or you can type your question in the chat room which is in the bottom left corner. Uh, I see that Will has just asked a question or a comment. It says regarding curation curriculum realignment, you mentioned release time. Release time is pretty complex. Would it be okay to simply designate an hourly rate of compensation for curation and mapping the textbook outline curriculum? For example, compensation for 14 hours at $50 for curation curriculum alignment to text plus an additional two hours of technology training. Yes, that works really well. Well, that's a great model, great example. And if you don't mind, we could possibly use that as an example um, in our other webinars and or on our FAQ. Um, Yes, we realize that release time is, is complex, um, and uh, so we encourage you to find um, strategies that will work within your um, your models on your campuses. Um, it could be paying a faculty member a thousand dollars for attending a workshop, um, and then that means they've also say, stated that they'll commit to selecting an OER down the road, et cetera. It might mean uh, paying a faculty member four hundred dollars or five hundred. You you have to set that those parameters on your campuses and then retaining some of those funds um, because the funding is kind of split around $1,000 per course but you can you know provide $500 for a faculty member who would be committed to doing this um, and that would be their stipend but then you retain some of those funds for marketing or a workshop um, uh, you know food or, or you know uh, collateral that you need to uh, notify folks on your campuses um, there are lots of different ways you can use communication resources that way through the funding as well. Um, great question, and thank you for asking that, Will. Okay. And Anne from San Jose State, who is our, uh, one of our librarians, um, has said that, yes, librarians are curation experts, so really consider using your reference librarians on your campus and bringing them into this process. If you set up a committee on your campus that are going to help with this um, responding to the um, RFP and might even help with the implementation over the next year, I would highly recommend you include someone from your campus library or district library um, because they will know how to get those resources, where they are, what they could be. And, uh, and the other aspect is to help them bring them into a collaborative project where they might not have been included previously and also help the instructors realize what kind of resources are available from that perspective as well. Hi, I, I had a question, Leslie. All right. This is Anne. Yes. Oh, OK. Go ahead. Um, I had a question about the timing. Our book order deadline is November 6, and we wouldn't find out about the funding till August 30th, and in between that, we'd want to have the workshops and have the faculty find their material. So I'm kind of concerned about having enough time for them to do that and get the orders in for the print copies. Could could the mm -hmm. announcement and what when's your book? Oh, I was going to ask. Could like the announcement of the award, not the transfer of the money, be done maybe a couple weeks earlier? Um, we're hoping to do so, but um, uh, right now that the, those dates are the way they are for the moment, um, and could remain that way because there are lots of different factors involved in the evaluation of the proposals, and we want to be as equitable as possible. 
Um, but from the perspective of book orders, if you receive the funding in October, uh, September, October, it's in enough time for spring orders, so for the spring of 17, um, and maybe the winter orders as well. So that's kind of what we're looking at right at the moment. So it probably won't be available for fall courses in an upcoming No, fall. we're looking at spring. Does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah. So we usually um, know that the textbook orders go in in um, that September, October, usually October time frame. Um, so hopefully that would be enough time for, uh, and maybe those faculty would already be, queued, well, the faculty would already be queued up to be participating because usually those courses will, will be um, listed on the proposal. So let's say you're selecting physics section one and two for spring 17. So we already know that those courses are going to be utilizing OER in the spring. So um, that could help with already that discussion or planning process taking place mm -hmm. earlier. Okay. Will, you have a question? Yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so um, I hate to belabor this point. I apologize, but it seems like there was a bit of um, conflicting inf info in the audio and in the text, and I just want to make sure we get our application right. Um, Dr. Harris said that faculty can't be compensated directly, um, and that I mean an hourly rate would be directly if we paid them an hourly rate. Right. Well, they, um, they, they, there's a definition um, of what are they being compensated for. So if it's for professional development or curation, which is part of professional development, um, that should be fine. It's that they can't be just handed funds for um, selecting a book and teaching it um, the next term. So there has to be some sort of activity around that, whether it's curation or professional development, consultation with the library, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, it's, it's in order, okay, I, I um, believe the reason why that was stipulated was, go ahead. Oh, I'm ahead, sorry, so, but, some time spent aligning the new text to the curriculum would be okay, in your view? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, again, it's it's part of that planning process that's um, very important, and um, that could be considered professional development. So I agree. I just wanted so, to um, hear from someone. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, um, just, um, I, and I think what um, um, Kathy was saying, or Dr. Harris was saying, is that um, you can you know, just uh, let's say I'm, I teach a course and I say, sign me up and, um, and you know, hand me $1,000 and off I go. And I don't really have any experience in professional development or in any of that curation, you know, because um, sometimes one book doesn't always work for a single course, and so there are lots of resources that um, can be revised, um, remixed uh, for a course. So that's what this is about, and um, and then and then working with other contexts on the campuses who could be supportive in that way, whether it's instructional designers or the um, uh, library librarians, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right. Thanks, Will. Thanks for your question. The link for the FAQs is on, um, maybe Teresa or Kathy, you could put that into the chat box since I'm not on the page right now. Um, and wait, Kathy, good. So there are the FAQs, the link to the FAQs. As I said, we posted those last week for the first time, and we already have a list of um, about 10 more questions that need to go up there this week on the process of doing that. Um, and you have a, 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 a plan to have that up by Friday. So, yeah, as Kathy said, all of the items that we talked about today are, are linked from the Cool for Ed homepage. And uh, we're very excited that you were interested in participating in the webinar today. And if you have any other questions, 
you saw the cool for ed. Um, let's see, it's cool for ed. Uh, it's cool. The email is um, <laughs> cool for ed at cdl. I should know. It comes to me. Cool for ed um, at cdl. edu is the email for further questions. We respond within 24 hours, and in other words, by the next day, if not the same day. And uh, we'll be happy to share uh, information. I highly recommend folks um, send their drafts so we can help them with that process for some of the gray areas that are maybe not as um, clear to you all or to anyone in this process. So, um, And your questions that you're providing us are also helping us in shape our FAQs. And hopefully we're um, going to become um, uh, make this process as, as easy as possible for anyone to participate in because that's the intention of it. It's not meant to be difficult. Um, so that that's our goal. All right. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, it was nice to meet you briefly. And um, uh, again, as we said, feel free to reach out. That's what we're here for. And uh, our goal, as I said, is to be uh, to make you as successful and to help the students be benefit from um, low cost, no cost materials in their courses. And uh, uh, on that note, um, I think I will sign off. <laughs>